You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Akmar Yacoub. How are you, brother? I'm good, brother. How are you? You okay? Good, mate. So, solicitor, motivational speaker. I've seen your videos on TikTok. We've became friends on Instagram. Yeah. It's been coming for a while. You're very outspoken. Probably the lawyer I would look for back in the day. But... Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, a lot yeah. of people don't see it like that. Yeah, because you're talking my shit. You're talking my lingo when going to courts and you sometimes you get the prim and proper lawyers who kind of look down at you. They do. And they, they're just full of shit. They're speaking big words I don't understand. So when I watch your videos, I go, good on you. Does that jeopardise your career though or anything? Could that come back and bite you in the ass? No, it hasn't up until now. But I've had reports made against me to the authorities because we are governed by the Solicitors Regulation Authority. I've had reports made to them that I'm inciting criminal behavior. Of course, I've made representations and they've come back and taken no further action because I'm not doing anything wrong. Mm-hmm. You're a solicitor, you should know the ins and outs of, of course. the law. Of so course. before we get into everything, no, I always go back to the start of my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, how you function, what you're all about, where you grew up, how it all began. I'm from Birmingham. Mm-hmm. I studied at Wolverhampton University not far from Birmingham, about half, 45 minutes away. Didn't do very well. Two, two, I got in my degree. After that, I did what's called a legal practice course that was in Birmingham at the College of Law. It's now called the University of Law. I did my legal practice course there. Then I did a training contract for two years. And after that, I basically went into the firm that I own now and volunteered to work there for free for about two years. And then after that, in October 2016, I basically took that firm over and now it is where it is. And I think we're probably one of the busiest firms in the whole country. What about family life, mum and dad, brothers, sisters? I've got four brothers, all older than me, and a big family, and four sisters, three are older than me, and one is younger than me. Two of them are ill, bless them. And that's it really. And I've got a wife and four kids, four boys. How old are you? How do I look? You look young, mate. You look late 20s, early 30s. Thank you. Thank you. What 35. <laughs> I'm 39, mate. It's a bastard, <laughs> <don't I? laughs> You're in the middle age of 30s. It's not too bad. It's once you get 38, 39. No way. You think about... Closer to the 40s. Yeah, then. yeah, that's when you think, fuck, where did it go? Time goes fast. Man. Yeah, but I still remember school times. Yeah, I was hard at school, mate. <laughs> I still remember them like it's yesterday. So, good upbringing then, brothers. Have you all got good jobs, kind of raised Yeah, very parents. good upbringing. My dad was a wealthy man. He used to um, be a wholesale milk supplier. He lives in Pakistan now. We retired my father. Mm-hmm. He lives there, he's chilling. But he, was, uh, he encouraged us to study. All brothers, few of us studied and few of us did it, basically. What's the background religion? Muslim? Muslim. So, see when it's all that kind of, the Muslim community, listen, I believe it's the strongest community in the world. I the, think they are as well. Uh, even the prisons, it's, it's the Muslim gangs that run the prisons. And with everybody, it's the fastest growing religion, I believe. Over two billion people now. Yeah, and it's, listen, I've got many Muslims brothers who I love to bits. Crazy bastards, some of them. Don't follow up 100%. There's many things in religion I agree with, I don't agree with, but that's no doubt to me, that's what people yeah, exactly. want to choose. So, like I say, the Muslim community is the fastest growing, and I've got many Muslim brothers who welcome me with open arms, their mums and dads, the food's amazing, love me to bits. Like I say, the boys, the sons who I grew up with when I was younger, mad, mad, mad bastards, mad, mad people. All welcoming and yeah, hot people though. But what I've realised with that is the upbringings of study, be, 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 I wouldn't say maybe intelligent, but be something, whether they're either becoming doctors or lawyers or top end work. Did you, was that ingrained in you from a very young age? From yeah, a it was. Father? And I think it was because of the fact that my parents were not educated. They studied to the extent that they could, you know, just 
in back home I'm talking about in Pakistan. I'm in Pakistan. I come from Kashmir, Azad Kashmir is called. So that's the free side of the occupied Kashmir. So Kashmir, there's a dispute. It's a disputed territory. I don't know if you know the ins and out. Pakistan and India, that's that's what their misunderstandings are over. And there's one part that is disputed. So it's neither theirs or neither India's. And there's one part that is not disputed and that's where I live. That's where we live. That's where from. And my dad probably went to school till he was about 13, 14 years old. Because financially, they wasn't very stable at all. My father used to tell me stories about when they never used to have food for days. So that one meal that used to come about, one proper meal, was something to look forward to. They never used to have new clothes. For example, you know, Eid or any kind of family celebrations. They never used to have clothes. So they used to wash their old clothes and wear them. And that was like a big thing, washing the clothes. So I heard all of that stuff. So my father used to say, listen, study, otherwise, mm -hmm. you know. Do you see that, Nalina? What a lot of dysfunctional families who are missing that father figure, you tend to see a lot of sadness and that's where the anger, the frustration, court life, prison life comes in where they come from broken homes. I think so, yes. I think it, it will. It does have a big impact not having a father about. I am very close to my kids and I'm very close to my father. Even up until now, when I'm making a big decision, whether it's a business decision or a life decision, I will have to call my dad and ask him if it's the right thing to do. And I am very close with my kids and they tell to talk to me. They're like, my, I'm their best friend. I'm my, my dad's my best friend, if you go on I me. And I tell my kids mm -hmm. as well, I said, I say to them that you don't need friends. Friends are just, friends come and go. If you've got a dad, you've got everything. Yeah, I believe so. It's a blessing, it's a blessing, it's, isn't it? Mum and dad to have both, you're the most blessed person on the planet. Because life comes so fast, such a fast pace, we take it for granted. We do. We don't realise how special life is, but there's so much mix up and fucking skullduggery goes on in this world that it's hard for people to live their best potential. What was your first ever job in the court? Uh, your first ever case? Case, yeah. yeah. My first ever, ever case was when I was a trainee solicitor. And this is a good story, this is, because what I did was this. As soon as I got into a law firm, I thought, what do I do now? How do I build a client base? So I went through my phone book and I would write all the numbers down on a sheet of paper and I would call them up. I say, hi, it's me, Ahmed. How's it good? People I know from school, college, university, from the local area. I grew up in a place called Aston, but I knew everyone, literally everyone there, because I used to work in my uncle's shop. So people used to come in and out, and I used to see everyone. I'm a very talkative person, I'm a friendly person, so I knew everyone. I start phoning everyone on my phone book and telling them I'm working in a law firm. The second day, somebody come through the door and they've told me, they were recommended by one of my school friends. So I rang him up, thanks for that. It was only a possession of a, a bladed article, a knife, but it was a big thing. I still remember the client, I still remember the client's name. I seen the client actually a few years ago and I called him by his name because how do you remember me? I go, I remember everyone, but I only remember him because of my first case. You know, I remember most of my cases, but you can't remember everybody's name sometimes. So that was my first ever case. He went and pleaded guilty and he got like a suspended sentence or something. What was the buzz like for you? It's good, you know. Because I got a bit of a pat on the back from my <clears throat> principal at the time, my boss, and uh, so I was happy, you know, I was a young Did kid. Did you have that business mindset straight away? Straight because away. listen, it's all right, you're doing your TikTok and your Instagram, but it's a business, an entrepreneurial ship where you've got to keep raising the bar to then having your own firm, that takes a bit of credit as well. So when you get through this, was it was automatically to try and get your own firm start up straight away? That was my target straight away. I wanted to build a network and I had a network already a bit of a network so I wanted to make that come to fruition so what I did was like I said I started phoning everybody what whoever I would see I would give them a business card now I don't carry cards on me anything I don't carry anything on me now but back then days I used to go go for a walk wherever I go I used to have a bunch of cards so yeah I had that business mindset from that time and my boss wasn't a good good boss basically he was always doubting me and saying to me, listen, you're not good for nothing. You don't know how to speak English properly. You need allocution lessons, elocution lessons, um, and all of that stuff. So, was he racist? 
He was is is a Pakistani guy. He wasn't racist, yeah. but he was a bit. I don't know. He was a bit, you know, cheeky. up his own arse here, cheeky. Yeah. I don't know. But anyway, so that was a big motivation for me. So when I left that place, we was never left amicably. You see, mm -hmm. I had a bit of an argument with him. I left, so I had to prove that that guy wrong. I left. I walked into the firm that I'm in now. So this was a firm that's closing down at that time in 2014. So I spoke to this guy, his name's Morris, Morris Andrews, his name is. And I said to him, I want a job. He said, I'm not looking to employ people. I'm winding, there's 70 plus at that time because I'm looking to wind down, I'm done. I said to him, look, you don't need to pay me. I'll just, I just want to work. I'll bring my own work, give me a commission and I'll be happy with that. So I started working for him. I started bringing my own work. And after a few years, I made him an offer he wasn't happy with the he gave me a figure that i wasn't happy with anyway in the end we shook on a deal and that's it to be fair god is my witness when i shook on that deal i never had a single penny to my name it goes back to network so i shook on the deal after that i come out of that room went on my phone and i knew i had to get his money together now which i did and since then with the help of the Lord, I've been blessed, brother man. I've been very blessed. What's the scariest case you've been in? Scariest case? In what way? Just where you've just been nervous about it and worrying. Just, where you just feel as if, fuck me, like, this is scary. Or does it just feel calm every time you go in? No, sometimes it's... Pressure. It, there's a lot of pressure from the families, especially. People's lives, man. People's lives, man. And one time this happened, uh, this was not... A couple of years ago, I represented someone on a murder case. And it was the circumstances of the offence were that basically the guy got shot outside his house from a car that was driving by. So they didn't, they just stopped, paused for a second, shot the guy and drove off. That was the shooting. My client was arrested. He asked for me. I went to the police station. The police officers gave me disclosure. Disclosure is the evidence that the police are going to use in the police station interview against my client. They gave me that. And they were attributing a phone number to my client. They said, this is the phone number. This phone number is involved in the murder in this way. It was in contact with the shooter throughout the day and just before the shooting and right after the shooting. Sort of saying that he set the shooting conspiracy. up. Conspiracy. Yeah, conspiracy basically. He said to me, look, I was at home at the time. I'm on tag. I'm on a door stop tag curfew, door stop curfew. And the police came in just before they saying that this guy died. They came and checked and I was at home. I didn't go nowhere. I said, no problem. But they're not saying you made, they're not saying you were there. They're saying you was involved somehow. The police don't have to give you the full, their full version at the start. They just give you enough to have an interview. So. I went into consultation now with that person, with my client. And I said to him, this is the phone number that the police are saying is yours. Is this your phone number? He said, no, this is not my phone number. I said, okay, what's your phone number then? He said, I don't have a phone. I said, who doesn't have a phone in this day and age? Stop lying to me. He goes, I'm not lying. I don't have a phone. And the police know that I don't have a phone. I go, how do the police know? Because I got attacked in the city centre a few weeks ago and I got robbed. And the police took my phones. Sorry, the people who robbed me took my phones. And then I called the police and told them that my phones have been taken. So that, that will be on record. I, go, I said to him, are you 100% sure? He turned around and said, he called me uncle. <laughs> he said, uncle, I'm a million percent sure. I go, well, then you're going to go home with me now then. I'm going to take you home. Because this is the only thing that they got against you. If they've got this number wrong, then you're good to go. Anyway, we're in the police station interview. So me being myself, I wasn't going to just sit there quietly. Or I didn't want to make him talk as well. Because sometimes when clients talk, they just incriminate themselves for yeah. other reasons. So <clears throat> if they don't need to talk, they don't need to talk. So I advised him that I said, let's do a prepared statement to put the number down and put everything down, denying that this is, a, this is your number and you've got nothing to do with it. End of story. They'll do their investigation, do their homework, and after that, come back and let you go. I put that down on the statement. I said, this number is not mine, and 
I'm not involved, basically. So the police officers, both of them looked at each other and started smiling. It's like they knew that this was going to come. I thought, I thought they're smiling because they think, oh, I've got the wrong person. The police officer then turns around and said, this phone number was used to call an insurance company to insure a vehicle. Guess who that vehicle is registered to? You. So I turned around and looked, and this person who found the insurance company introduced himself as you and gave this phone number. That's one of the reasons we're saying this is your phone number. Secondly, this phone number has called every single member of your family apart from one member. That member is your grandmother and we think that it hasn't called that number because it's, you live with here. So you don't need to call here, you could just go to the house. Anyway, I said to the police at the time, I'll go stop the interview. I need to speak to my client. Spoke to him, I said, what did you lie to me for? He said, I smoke cannabis. I go, what's that got to do with it? He goes, I forgot. I go, you forgot that you had a phone. So I had a bit of a falling out with him because it's not that, it's, it's not about how I, I felt that, I felt I done him a disservice because I shouldn't have put that statement, I shouldn't have believed him. But then if I can't believe my own clients, who should I believe? Makes you look stupid. Exactly, yeah. What's the difference between a lawyer, solicitor, or barrister? A lawyer is a word used to describe either a solicitor or a barrister. So it's the same stuff as a barrister as a lawyer, basically? Yeah. A barrister is a lawyer, a solicitor is a lawyer. So see when you go through your education stuff, what's the process? How many years do you need to go to be a lawyer? Because Scotland and England are different. It's different lawyer. Yeah. A different jurisdiction. It's probably the exactly same in terms of academic qualifications. Mm -hmm. It's probably the same, but mm -hmm. it's different law-wise. We can only practice in England and Wales. You have to go to university and do a qualifying law degree for three years. But there are some institutes now that you can complete that in two years. After that, you do a legal practice course. And then you have to work under someone for about two years. And then you are qualified. And then you have to um, work for about three years as a qualified solicitor. And then you can go and open your own firm. How many cases have you worked so far? I don't count. Loads. Over, over a thousand probably in the last 10 years. And you're all over England and Wales? All over England and Wales. What's the longest trial you've worked on? Carlisle probably. So see when you're going through a, a trial, how much preparation do you need if it's a big one? If it's a big one, it depends. What Most cases, I'm just saying if it's a big drugs conspiracy, if I'm representing a client, their role will only be minimal. So if there's about 10,000 pages on that case, I probably only have to read about 500 of them. It all depends. Sometimes I put in minimal effort and got the results. Sometimes I have to put in a bit more effort. So it all depends on the case. More serious, the more effort, I would say. If it's a murder case, it's draining because then you see of course, you know, the victim's photos, like the last murder case I did, client got convicted. I did. The victim's photos were basically post-mortem photos and they, they skinned him basically. So you could see the inside uh, of, or, you know, his skin's gone off. They've skinned him and so they do the, they done the post-mortem. So you see a lot of stuff in murder cases. And then you have the families of the defendant, because he's, of course, in remand. They are very demanding as well. So, you know, they always want mm. updates and stuff like that. So it's very demanding. How mentally. does that affect you when you see photos, dead bodies, some barristers, lawyers are seeing kids being fucking raped and all the dark shit? Like, how do you, how do you separate it from work to going home to seeing your own kids? I think you... Can you switch off? You can't really, I think you become immune to it, to be fair. It's like a doctor. If a doctor 
he gets nervous and his hands start shaking when he's about to operate on someone, a surgeon, sorry, that person might die. So you have to sort of become immune to, you have to kill your conscious to a degree, I would say. Mm -hmm. I don't do sex cases, the kids ones though. I don't do them ones. Yeah, they're fucking heavy, aren't they? No. Nah, well, that's dark, dark, isn't it? That's, that's bad. Mm -hmm. That's very bad. So when did the social media say stuff? What was the idea behind that? In COVID. Was that business idea or was it just having fun with it? Just to get out there, business, yeah. Mm -hmm. And free education for people. A lot of people don't know the basics of law. So I, when I was a kid, I didn't know. Yeah, because you, you always shout out, there's a, there's a defense for every offense. Defense for every offense. Mm -hmm. Which in in theory, if you look at it, if you see a solicitor or a lawyer or a barrister, they'll tell you that there's not a defense for every offense because there's some offenses that are strict liability offenses. You either did it or you haven't. But what I say is, even if there isn't a defense, for example, a possession of a firearm, if, if it's been found on your person, or if it's been found in your vehicle, you'll be charged for that. In law, there's no defense for that. But if you go to court and you plead not guilty, you have to put forward an explanation, don't you? You have to say mm -hmm. something. Why are you not guilty? So that will amount to a defense in the end. Mm -hmm. So technically there is, in theory it's not, but technically if you look at it, there is a defense for every offense. What's the basic stuff? Obviously, listen, I was always grew up, snitches get put in ditches, no comment all the way. If you get fucking put into the cop shop, no comment, because a lot of people who are in prison, they've spoke their self there. There's too many grasses, too many snitches, and they're actually snitching on themselves because they're trying to talk their way out of it, which is fucking so silly. What is the basics of, listen, wait to your lawyer, because a lot of people crumble. They do. A very big mistake that people make is exactly what you just said, start snitching on themselves and they think that they're going to talk their way out of being arrested or being charged. That's never going to happen. You know that, everybody knows that. But people, I think it's the pressure. When they get arrested, they get under pressure. That's what they talk. It's all, it's all about pressure because if they're calm, I don't think they would talk. So a lot of people, they start talking whilst they're being arrested. Once the police officer has said, I'm arresting you and cautioned you, no matter what you say to them, they are going to take you to the station and they will interview you. So if you really want to talk, you can talk in the interview if you've been advised to talk. There's times that I advise people to talk when they sit down and they say, look, they've got the totally wrong man. It's not me. Even then, sometimes I would say, look, we'll do a prepared statement. So we've got it on record. We're denying it. So if you ever get charged, we are denying it from the outset. Sometimes I would advise people, listen, the evidence is strong. You don't want them to get any more information. No comment is my advice. Sometimes you tell them to talk. It all depends on the circumstances. Have you ever told somebody, listen, you've done bank your rights, plead guilty, shorter sentence, and have not listened, and they've got a bigger sentence? Yes. Yes, they have. Does that happen frequently? Not frequently, because I think now it's come to a stage that people... They take my advice seriously, clients do sometimes. Some clients think they're too clever, but most of the clients- they Not take, that clever for me, the fucking of lawyer. Of course, exactly. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I've seen is prison lawyers, you know, a lot of people who are in prison, they, they act like lawyers and a lot of my clients who are on remand, they say, oh, this guy from this wing said that. I go, what is he in there for? Well, you know, <laughs> if he knew something, yeah. if he was that clever or he knew about the law, why is he doing inside prison? So, yeah. Sometimes you talk, sometimes you don't. What happened with the guy you told with pleads guilty? I told him to, uh, there's loads, it's not just once. Mm -hmm. Just say some people will want to have trials and the defences will be stupid. They think a jury is stupid. A jury is 12 members, upstanding members of the community with no previous convictions and they are mentally able so they are judging the trial based on the evidence before them. So the prosecution comes with their case first, then the defense comes, and then the judge directs them about the law. They're not stupid. So you have to have a plausible explanation at least. You can't just say it wasn't me or they're lying or the police are lying. A lot of people will say the police are lying. They say me up, they made it up and stuff like that. So in one case, I told a guy to plead guilty, get a lesser sentence, you get, you get a bit of credit. If you want, 
I can put forward a basis of plea for you, like a plea deal, so we get your sentence reduced. He wasn't having none of it. He would have got six based on my advice, but he got 11 after trial. So he chose. Do you ever see people going down crying? A lot of people, they have, they have tears in their eyes. I can see the regret straight away. Yeah, that's the only thing. A lot of people think they're big mans, but when they go down, I've seen it. <coughs> I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, it's a livelihood, like. man. That's the thing with men. A lot of people play the act of a clown and a, and a strong man, but they're not. You see them oh, crumble. Man. Anybody would crumble. No man is ready to do 25 years in prison. No man. Mm -hmm. And imagine they've done that because you get 25 years for something like murder. Imagine you're going to prison for 25 years. You've not made a single penny because you're going just because you killed somebody. You had a fight. You had a disagreement and you couldn't sort it out. That's how egoistic you are. You had to kill that person. And then you're doing 25 years. Your whole life is finished. You've not made a single penny. If you've made money from a crime, at least you've benefited something, haven't you? But non-financial crimes, murder and stuff like that. So there's a lot of people in there that are regretting what they've done. Yeah, the majority of people have some remorse. Not them all, but most of them do. When they do their courses and stuff, they realise how sometimes those short bad decisions can change their whole life and other people's think, lives. I don't think there's anybody that I've met till this day that is involved in a murder case or a serious violence case that actually wanted to hurt someone that bad. There's only one person I've met, that's it. Should I tell you what that person said to me? He stabbed the guy about 19 times while sitting in, on top of him. And the guy survived with, the mir with a miracle, you know. His death wasn't written, the Lord wanted him to live. That's all it was. So I've gone to see this guy. And I said, good, at least it's attempted murder, not murder now. He turned around and said, well, when I'm going to be inside, I will know at the back of my head that guy's breathing still. That's going to hit me more. I thought it was okay then. <laughs> but yeah. Have you ever had anyone come in and admit murder straight away? Have they always pleaded innocent? They won't plead, no. They, I don't know. They haven't, no one's admitted like, yeah, I actually did it. There have been sometimes that people have said, yes, I did stab the guy, but he came, he had the knife on him. This is a case. I'm talking about a scenario in a case. He had the knife on him. He came to me with the knife. I managed to disarm him. We were in a tussle. The so, knife. Self-defense. Self-defense, yeah. The knife was inserted into his chest. I didn't know it was going to pierce his heart. He bled to death. So that's the scenario I've been in before as well, what the clients I've been in. What makes a good lawyer? A good lawyer looks at the evidence and explains the evidence, the strengths and the weaknesses to his client properly. Doesn't hide behind big words, has good communication skills, so keeps the client updated and reassures the client. Although sometimes you have to be realistic but we're dealing with grown men. 99.9% .9 of the times clients are grown men. So you have to be realistic with them. Don't sugarcoat anything. I, I've seen a lot of people, a lot of lawyers sugarcoat. I could do this for you. I could do this for you. When she is the fan, they know where to be seen. I can still go and see clients that I've represented, that have been convicted, or have got big sentences. I can't change the evidence. Isn't it? it's, it's not... That's not my job. I can't, the CPS are the ones who got the evidence. So I've, I'm still in contact with people who are saving life imprisonment. They call me now and again, I chat to them. So you have to have good communication skills. Has anybody ever tried to put it on you, threaten you? Yeah. Have they? I made a video once when I'm speaking about a client of mine's. It was a murder trial where a client of mine was the only one who got acquitted of the murder, but he got convicted of the manslaughter. So I made a video about that, you know, just published, published my result. Someone, of course, never liked it. So I started getting phone calls, uh, blah, 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 because the victim in that case was a young lad. Was a young, unfortunate, you know, of course, I don't encourage people to go and do crime or people to go have knives. I discourage that on a huge scale. I even spoke 
up against drug dealing and all of that stuff because I've got my own kids. I don't like to see other people's kids doing that stuff. It's just, it's not good. It's not pleasing. They found me and they were threatening me. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. So I just had to tell them, listen, do one. Then the second or third phone call, you need to delete that video. I go and delete my video. That's my TikTok, my Instagram. No one's going to tell me what to do on it. I've not said no names. I've not said nothing. All I've said is this is a widely reported case. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to delete it because what, if I delete that video, people will start following me for every video I'm making. <laughs> so I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite right. You've got to stand your ground. You have to. So see when you're going through all that then, but what's the rules and regulations with the social media side of things of doing stuff like that? Obviously I'm not mentioning names and what cases they are, but you must be close to the bone when you're doing those videos. Uh, I think I am. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes you can say that, but I, the, as long as I'm not inciting any criminal behaviour, I can't advertise. Back, I think about 36, 37 years ago, there was no advertising, but since then, they've bought solicitors can advertise. So I'm not doing nothing wrong. I'm, as long as the clients are happy, sometimes you must have seen my videos. I have clients sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's got a good result, I ask all my clients, anybody got a good result, I ask them to come. Some of them come, some of them don't. A lot of them don't because they don't want to be seen. But a lot of them come. So as long as I'm not doing anything wrong, I can say whatever I want. And I'm not directly advising anyone to do anything. I'm giving them scenarios in my cases. If you get what I mean? Yeah, of course. I'm simply saying... My client was charged with this. We put this defense forward and he got found not guilty. If that's, if that's what I'm talking about. So I'm not saying nothing wrong. What's your most viewed video? Probably about 2 million. What did you say? 220 kilos of class A drugs. That's what my client was charged with. And today he was found not guilty. After, the, after pleading his innocent to the NCA at the police station stage and now at the Crown Court today at Birmingham Crown Court he was found not guilty remember there's a defence for every offence <laughs> <laughs> see, see when you go through all that and do your videos are you planning them or are you just off the cuff off the cuff off the cuff mm -hmm. so the basics that people need to know so if the cop was coming Back in the day when we were fucking driving the streets of Glasgow, they used to pull us all the time. <laughs> and But now you see videos of people telling them to fuck off and you can't pull me. We couldn't do that. <laughs> they were bad. <laughs> yeah, but so what's the... If a, the coppers pull you over, mm. obviously you see people now saying, am I being detained? Yeah. yeah. Have I done anything? They say no. They're just driving mm. away. Like, how legit is that? Because if we'd done that it's back legit, in the yeah. day, they would just... They would chase us. Yeah, they, they would fucking See, look, what, us. one thing the police don't like... I've got nothing against the police, by the way. Yeah, Before, same, not now. Nothing, nothing, I've got nothing against the police. I actually love the police because if something was to happen to my family, I'd be the first person to call them if I was getting burgled or robbed. Mm -hmm. Once, if if you are stopped by the police, please, and they, you're not obliged to answer any questions unless it's, uh, you're a risk to um, national security and stuff like that, which is extreme. We're talking about a normal stop and search here. So you've just been stopped. They can ask you, if it's a routine check, they'll ask you for your car, uh, insurance, uh, insurance and stuff like that. Once you've given them that, you ask them if you're free to go. You can't, or you are not obliged to answer any further questions. So if they start asking you about where you're going, uh, what you're doing in this area, who's with you, who you're going to see, you don't need to answer all of that. Once you've given them what they require, then you can go. But... I would ask everybody to be cooperative and calm because the police do have powers. All they need to say is I need to search you for prevention of a crime. I feel, or I can smell cannabis in the car, or I feel a drug deal is take, taking place. Done. They feel it, they can do it. So just be calm and cooperative. The human beings, if you be nice to them, they let you go in it. The people are on it for it as well, where they feel as if they're trying to, don't pull me over, don't talk to me, you can't ask that. Sometimes I say, You look, can get frustrated with these videos Because I see videos And the person is acting like a dick As well behind yeah, the camera Yeah exactly, and thinking, exactly why? Listen there's some couples out there That are pricks And they do Try and infuriate Some of them are good Of course I've yeah. got police officer friends mm -hmm. They're not all bad 
there are very bad police officers. I mean, I'm going, I'm doing a trial right now and it involves a police sergeant, an ex-police sergeant, and he is going, he's giving evidence right now and he is describing how he was treated in the workplace by other police officers, racist remarks and all sorts, he's an Asian lad. So, they're not all bad. And like you said, some of these guys behind the camera, they're acting like dicks. Mm -hmm. So, what do you expect the police officer to do? So be nice, they're humans as well. You know, and they're doing a job, they're not doing nothing wrong by just pulling you doing a routine job. Yeah, of course. If somebody's, if somebody's giving you attitude, yeah, give a bit of attitude back. But sometimes they can abuse their power just like anybody. In of life. course, that's what I just said. Yeah. All they need to say is, yeah, I can smell cannabis. That's mm -hmm. all they need to say. What about for warrants? Because coming through your door, they can't come in your house unless they've got a warrant. Is that 100% legit? Like, they have to have a warrant. Because they always ask, can I come in? They do. They have to have a warrant. And that warrant has to be specific to what they're looking for. So if they are looking, for example, for you here, they are not going to search inside a handbag or inside the washing machine, for example. You get what I'm trying to say. They have to be specific. So if they're looking for something, if they're looking for firearms, for example, and they take a shitload of your money, when they come here, they have to give that money back to you because that warrant was only specific for the firearms. Mm -hmm. You have three months to challenge warrants as well. So if somebody gets raided, they have three months to judicially review that warrant. A judge can review that warrant and check if it's correct or not. And that's done obviously by going to court and stuff. But the main thing is it has to be specific to what they're looking for. What do you think the law in the UK? Do you think the system's good or do you think it's flawed? What's that? The system in the UK, prison system. The prison or remand, the, or the law remands here and sentences are not too bad compared to America where people get 150 years. You can bond remand for five and six years. Like, it's fucking crazy. Bad. We have custody time limits here, don't we? Mm -hmm. I don't know about America. So when you are arrested... I think it's a year here now. Six it used months. to be... No, in Scotland's different. It Scotland's used to probably, be, yeah. It used to be 100 and, it's 120 days. Yeah, that's six and months. And then they changed that again. No, that was four months. But yeah, just under four months. Yes, yeah. but they change that again. Sometimes I think they can hold you for a year. On demand, I'm not sure. Listen, I've not been in the jail in many years. Touch wood, hopefully it stays hopefully that Hopefully you way, don't but need, but yeah. you know what to come to if you're going to yeah. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, all changed. So see when you're in demand here in England, because in Scotland you get a visit every day. Is this the same for England? I don't know how the visit system works. I'm not too clued on about the actual mm -hmm. prison system. But in terms of the judicial system, you have custody time limits. And you have six months from the date that you were charged to have a trial. Yeah, I think and, it, it's a year in Glasgow. They can hold them. Yeah, they can drop your papers of the year on the day with a charge sheet. But if they don't, the case gets thrown out. Oh, okay, okay. It's like that. But here it's a bit different. And the CPS can some sometimes apply for extensions, which they tend to get if they've been expeditious and they've done everything correctly. And, and it's not because of their mistake or their fault that the case is being adjourned then it's quite easy for them like during covid a lot of people custody time limits were getting extended recently barristers were striking because of criminal legal aid because of that a lot of cases were getting adjourned and a lot of custody time limits were getting extended as well did it record the interviews in england yeah v video camera some interviews are video camera yeah when did it choose when and not to because I've seen some like fucking serial killers or bad shit and they're recording us. The, the last, cameras. sometimes they do it because they want to look at your body language. Mm -hmm. they probably, they've probably got somebody sitting there looking at your body language. The last case that I had recorded was last year as a terrorism case. And they were they recorded my consultation, not my consultation with my client, but my consultation with the police officers and they recorded, video recorded the whole interview. So sometimes they do some, I think more serious offences they do it for, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what it could be, body language and stuff, looking at that. Mm. So see when you do your videos, is it has to be, just, yeah, yeah, it must be. Has anybody ever came forward and say, look, fucking calm it down a bit? Or is everybody okay with it? Some people do, a lot of people talk bad about me. <laughs> <laughs> I had a barrister on, yeah, yeah, and you messaged me, Big Tony. And he was saying there's a guy yeah. on fucking TikTok and he, uh, he's fucking... I was like, hey, hey, he's messaged me. I don't know. Because I've never seen many people who does it because you're, you're out there. Yeah. So you're like a, you're like a salesman. 
It's like a sales pitch. It's like somebody selling cars. You're there with a nice suits, glasses, big car, nice watch. It's just like, but it's fucking business and it's got your name out there. It has You're sitting a, on podcasts now. You have to market yourself. If you uh -huh. can't market yourself, who are you going to market? You know, you have to market yourself. A lot of people talk bad. But the thing is, I think they're just jealous. I think they're just haters. I'll be honest with you mm -hmm. straight up. The thing is, I'm quite young in this profession as a lawyer. I've been in this profession for about 10 years, but I think I'm the most recognized in the whole of UK right now, uh, lawyer-wise. And my firm is very busy. So a lot of people are jealous. So they do say stuff. That barrister was basically saying that I'm promising all sorts of stuff to people, but I'm not. I've never promised anything. I've actually made a video of a role play video where I get a phone call and the client's asking me, the potential client's asking me, can you guarantee me a win? I said, no, I can't guarantee no wins. But the only thing me and my team can guarantee you is we will leave no stones unturned in the preparation of your case. And that's the only guarantee I can give you. Other than that, I can't give you no guarantees. The only guarantee you got in life is death. I can't guarantee nothing. So that guy was saying, I'm promising stuff. I'm not promising anything to anybody. <laughs> Come on. Is there anybody else doing what you're doing with social media just now who's working in law? Some people are trying. Copying you now. Yeah, they're copying me, which is good. I like it. It's good. Yeah, that's a format. Mm. What is this, a format? Something anyway, if somebody copies you. Appreciation. I think they pre they must appreciate it's me. It's the highest form of... Inspiration. Yeah. I don't know. So see when you're doing your videos then... Like, uh, what's uh, how how has business been since they've all been released? Has it went through the roof? More clients? Yeah, a lot more inquiries. I would say some people just call just to speak to me. I'll be honest with you, not just generally, just just to have a chat with me. But because of um, the length in a case concluding, and I'm getting a lot of new clients. I would say yes, I'm getting a lot of new clients because. A lot of people don't know what to do when they get arrested. They don't know what happens. They don't know that they can call a lawyer and they can call a lawyer free of charge at the police station. Some people, they think that they need to pay and that's the only time somebody will come and represent them. That's a misconception people have in the, in the UK. There's one thing good about the UK system, legal aid. So you can be a young lad, no job, and you can get... Potentially me representing you if you're up for a big serious case. Mm -hmm. Do you pick and choose your clients now? Myself personally, yes. I like to deal with about 10 to 15 cases a year myself personally. But I've got a team, there's 15 of us. 10 so. to 15 cases a year? Yeah. One case near enough a month? One yeah. or two? Mm. That's fucking all right, isn't it? It's all right. Isn't it? Yeah. Living a good life, bro. All right, yeah. Is that a blue, whose blue Lamborghini was that? Mine's. Fuck shit, I need to become a lawyer, bro. I'm doing it wrong in this podcast game, mate. <laughs> man, you're doing well, man. You're probably making more money than me. Nah, we're smashing it, to be fair, mate. Right. So, but are you enjoying it? Do you enjoy law? I love it, you know. Do people take you serious with all the videos you're doing as well? Are you, are you up there with people going, yeah, he's good at his job? Or yeah, is other lawyers See, kind me, of talk behind your back? I don't know about the lawyers. I don't really get along with much lawyers. I think they, most of them, they don't like me. I don't know why. But I don't get time to basically socialize anyway. And I like to not be around negative people or drama. So I don't, but a lot of people, even before the social media stuff, I was doing cases and I was doing big cases. It's, I think it's where I was brought up. Uh, like I said, I was very well known. And just, just by being nice and friendly. So when I was brought up, a place called Aston, a lot of crime. A lot of criminals, potential criminals. So I knew everybody. So when I got into the law game, like everybody started using me and everybody, where the mouth got around, you get one result and 10 people talk about it. You're bound to get another case out of that. That's how it works. That's how life works, isn't it? You get good results. You provide a good service. More people are going to come to you. Nobody is coming to me just by seeing a video. They have to do their research. So somebody, sometimes people look at my videos, but then I'll get a phone call by somebody who knows me personally, and they say, this guy wants your number, blah, blah, blah. He's asked me, and I've recommended you. Then they'll phone me. It's like that as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people get hold of me uh, on a personal level. They find somebody who knows me, and then they'll come as well. It's, it's, for example, if you now are getting done for murder, I just say, you're not just going to take what I'm saying by face value. You will need a bit of research, background research. So I've got history. I've been getting good results. Mm -hmm.
Very do you enjoy, do you enjoy, enjoy being it. a lawyer? I love it. I love my job, you know. I wouldn't change it. I would never change it. The best feeling ever, better than sex, is basically getting those two words, not guilty at the end of a big trial that you worked hard on. Hard work pays off. It's, it's the, I can't describe it. It's the best feeling ever, brother. Working on a big trial, how much preparation goes into it? It depends how long the trial is and it all depends on, for example, the terrorism case I'm doing right now, um, basically it's about 400,000 pages of um, electronic material, laptops, phones, everything. So I'm having to go through all of that. And a lot of legal visits every week I'm going to see the client because you could get life imprisonment. So the more sentence the client is potentially facing, the more preparation and time that he requires and he actually deserves to be fair. It's his life, isn't it? So I, sometimes the thing is, I say this to clients as well, it's not about how much times I'm coming to see you. I've seen you, you've given me instructions. I don't need anything else off you now. Now let me do my work and my work is done properly when I've got no one disturbing me in the office or in my house. Me seeing you all the time is not going to win your case. Me looking for ways to win your case when I'm in the right frame of mind is going to help you. So you, sometimes it's not about babysitting as well. What about the jury? Do you look at juries and, and see who could potentially sway your way? Or is it just a case of... We do, yeah. I think all lawyers do that, must do that. So you look at that, that guy looks okay. But you can never read a jury. You can't mm -hmm. read a jury. You can't read anybody because you don't know what they're thinking in their head. Sometimes I've looked at juries and I've thought to myself, looks like a tough one. <laughs> and it's been a not guilty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the hardest thing about being a lawyer? Hardest thing, I think... Being a busy lawyer is to manage your caseload. And you're never going to make everybody happy and you're never going to get the desired, desired result on every single case that you do. So you have to come, you have to face the fact that you're not going to win everything and you're not going to make everyone happy. So pleasing everybody, I'm, I've never been after that anyway, but the hardest thing probably is to manage the caseload. And probably, you know, when people get convicted, sit with them after, after they've been convicted and now they're looking at 25 years in prison. Don't know what to say to them. How's that feeling? Do they ever blame you? No, nobody's ever blamed me, to be fair, uh, which is a good thing. Because they, they see the effort, don't they? They see the effort and they know I can't change the evidence. The evidence is the evidence. The prosecution are bringing the case. It's not me, isn't it? Do, they, do you know sometimes that they're fucked? Yeah. I've told people... Let me tell you a quick story. I told somebody to plead guilty on a case once, back in 2017. It could have been 16 as well. 16, I think it was. 2016, sorry. I told that guy to plead guilty on a case. It was a Section 18 case. Nasty Section 18, domestic violence related as well. Very bad injuries. I advised him, I go, the evidence is strong. They're saying it's you. Why would they say? Anyway, you should plead guilty. Me and my barrister, we both sat with him and, and his father. And we said, look, we feel that enter a guilty plea, try to get a lesser sentence. He went and had a trial. Well, he went, I went as well, the barrister went as well. We had a trial. He got found not guilty. After the trial, he comes up to me and he said, I don't know how that's happened, but I have to thank you. And I have to thank the Lord. He turned around and says, I want to be a lawyer. Will you give me a job if I get the qualifications? I thought he's chatting it. I said, of course I will. Anyway, fast forward a couple of years. He's going to qualify as a solicitor in the next six months. That's good, man. Do you ever look at people though and you see the broken souls where you think there's no chance of them ever doing anything with their life? That like You see a lot of people in courts and... It's sad to think, but it's not as if they belong there, but you just know that's... that's they've that chosen life, their life yeah. and they don't want to get out of it. There, there are people like that. that yeah. I mean, in my profession, I meet a lot of people, you know. And there's some people, and you look at them, this guy's not a criminal man. What's he doing here? Some people, I think it's peer pressure when they get involved. Some people, they do it for financial, for a financial gain. Some people do it for that clout and that status thing, that fame. There's a lot of people that do it for different reasons, but I, I, I see them all, I see them all. I've seen people, like, I've seen females giving birth inside prison. 
I've seen female drug dealers. I've seen female killers. Um, I represented a woman once. She killed her husband. It's all sorts. You don't you meet everyone. Who's it better to work with, the females or the male? Males, I think. No, I'm not being sexist or anything. No, of course. Because uh, they understand. Uh, and plus, they're men. And so I can be myself, you know, to an extent, of course, with them, but with females sometimes. I've got female staff as members as well. So, but males, uh, clients are always better to work with than female clients. Why is it a female murderer gets a lesser sentence than a male murderer? Every female I've had on have always got lesser sentences either because maybe it's abuse from the husband or it's... I was just, I was yeah, just so that's where it all that comes from, abuse of partner. A period of uh, abuse, provocation, and uh, a women, a w women generally won't go and try to plan to murder somebody. It was most likely heat of the moment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I've not come across the planned murder yet. It's always at the heat of the moment. They'll be doing something pick up a knife I've, I don't know have you come across a woman shoot I've not come across a woman shoot yeah have you Linda Calvary she was a bank robber okay. mad bastard mate they called her the black widow every husband she was that was in her life was either murdered or life or off no way she was actually convicted of murder where but was she from London wow mad she wrote the, wrote the book the black widow I'm still friends with Linda mad bastard but okay. she tells you to be home at 8 o'clock from the pub mate you're, you're home at 5 so that's the right. kind of women, mate, like, you know, not to fuck around. There's some women more dangerous than the male. They are, yeah. Look at that uh, Queen of the South. Mm -hmm. What's her name? Res Resorta Blanco or something from Colombia. What's the le least charge? What's the least thing you can ever get charged with? What's the smallest thing you can get charged with? S smallest thing, probably um, possession of a cannabis or something. Mm -hmm. uh, or like a financial penalty, breach of breach peace. peace, breach of peace, breach of peace, shouting in the street, yeah, shouting in the street, mm -hmm. something. Why did he even? Why are they even charges? I don't know. Some guy got charged with breach of peace um, at a Liverpool game. It was something about ninety seven or something. I think because nineteen ninety seven something happened. Yeah, and I think he wrote not enough. Oh, like, not enough. Yeah. Um, 97, but the guy, he, he'll get fucking done because it was the Hills Brothers after that. That's what I thought later on. Yeah, I Man City fan. Yeah, yeah, so there's 97 people passed away, but yeah, he'll get fucking done. That's heavy. And for anybody who's even put that on his top, it's just That's as bad. bad. I didn't know what I A grown man. Football. Yeah, a grown man. That was man. like a man you and Man City game. Yeah, I'm not into football, but when I seen that, I thought that was a bit bad. He got charged with breach of peace or something, or inciting hatred or something yeah, like but that. He'll get done. He'll fucking get done. social media. Probably going to go to prison for that. Yeah, social media went off. It's not. Mm. So it understandably, man. Mm -hmm. Understandably. Yeah, it's definitely, man. You don't make fun of the dead, especially something as tragic as that. What's the worst charge? Murder, obviously. Yeah. Murder. Mm -hmm. Rape. Yes, child fucking paedophilia. Paedophilia, man. Disgusting. Yeah. Disgusting. I've 10 cases away before involving that even though i'm not one to judge whether somebody's guilty or not but i don't want to look through all of that stuff it's just not and me. defend someone who's a yeah. fucking sex case yeah yeah, yeah as a father that like, like, can't uh, yeah you'd, you'd fucking get the cunt guilty even though you're defending them <laughs> <or not. laughs> no, i won't say nothing for uh, that but yeah do you ever get questions from the coppers with clients of that can never come to you no, never no no that's what i'm saying that's what I, i'm very outspoken i say whatever i want not whatever i want within the law within the remits of the law even when i go to court you know i've got a bit of balls i can talk a lot of people are scared the lawyers are scared to say certain things in court because the judge will have a go at them so what the judge not going to lock you up mm -hmm. the way it's going to happen is going to send your client to prison for a couple of more days but so what is there certain judges you like working with or being in the same courtroom with because you know the judges and lords are they're ruthless, they're a different, different animals, that lot. No, some of them are very nice, some of them are, depends, some of them have had personal experiences. I know a judge whose daughter died of a drug overdose, so what do you think he would do when he gets a drug yeah. dealer in front of him? So it's because their people don't forget. Mm -hmm. They imagine somebody's had a family member killed. Drink and driving. Then, uh, there you go. I got six months for driving out disqualified, but Lenny, there you go. fucking lawyer says it was... I'll see you at one o'clock. I was on the bus to Berlin at 10 in the morning. Fucking stupid charge. Six months, man, for nothing. Wow. Driving well disqualified. I think it was the third or 
fourth time, I think they were cracking right down on it then. Mm, you done that though? Yeah, that was football, yeah, it was years ago. That was fifteen years ago. Wow, long time, mate. Wow, long time, bro. Time goes mm -hmm. quick, innit? Where do you go with the future with football? Where do you see yourself? I want to do this for a few more years and then get into. I do a lot of the business ventures as well. I'm getting into a few more um, ventures in in Pakistan and over here as well. Just fit properties and stuff. But I want to actually pack it up after a couple of years. Because, like I said, it's, it's financially very good. You have to be good at your job to make money. Any job you have to be good at is you, you have to be good mm -hmm. at it, otherwise you're not going to make money. It's not going to just fall on your lap. You have to be a card. So, but financially, it's very draining. So after a couple of years, I do want to pack it up and do something else. Mm -hmm. Retire, probably. Don't know. Fuck, say it's all right. Because you see people working to their 60s and 70s, you just love it that much. I know, but what's the point? I mean, I know people, but they don't. their response is, what else do we do? Do we sit at home all day? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Could you become a judge or a lord? Or... Yes, yes. Um, you have to be a practicing solicitor for 10 years. I've only been doing it for nine, qualified. So after next year, I can um, do my judge course and do my exams and can. It's, it's not that difficult. What's your best memory of being a lawyer? My first not guilty plea on a big case where it was a conspiracy to murder. Nine people were on that case. Just my client got found not guilty, mm -hmm. and uh, I've got I've got a good relationship with that client now. And you know he keeps phoning me sometimes. After he's bought a house recently, he phoned me. He had a kid. He phoned me and he said, "Look, this wouldn't have been possible without you, man." I was probably grateful. He's a good friend of mine. Man. What's your worst experience? Worst experience was probably that case I spoke about where I should have just not done the prepared statement on that murder case where the client lied to me because at night then I was I couldn't sleep I couldn't sleep and I kept mentioning, mentioning it to my wife she turned around and said look you don't kill yourself over it you did that because he lied I said okay he lied to me but I shouldn't have believed him that's my mistake mm -hmm. so but you learn as you go you're going to you learn, learn as you go mistakes. did they ever catch him with the phone uh, no but how they could attribute it to him. But could they still prove that it was his phone or yeah, have yeah. used that? They will, they will. They have. So at court, uh, I had to give that case up basically then. Mm -hmm. But at court, the prosecutor can now go to the jury and say to the jury that this guy has already lied once in the police station interview. What makes you think he's not lying now? So imagine that being said to a jury member. Mm -hmm. So is that beyond reasonable doubt? Beyond reasonable doubt, the jury have to be sure beyond reasonable doubt. So that basically means this. I describe it two ways, very easy. So you've got a glass of water here. The prosecution have to make the jury sure. So the glass of water has to be clear. Our job is simply to muddy those waters, a little bit of mud, and that's doubt done. Has to be not guilty. You have to be 100% sure. Another example, who wants to be a millionaire? You're, you're on the million dollar or million pound question now. And, but you've got your three lifelines. The question, you think you know it. You think you know that question. You're 99.9% .9 sure that you know that question. But you've got a lifeline. So you said, okay, I'll just phone a friend just to get that 100% sure. That's not guilty. What's it like doing the final speech or the, was it the final statement? What do they call that? The end speech? Closing speech. Closing yes. speech. Closing speeches. Do you get like, nervous? No, I don't do them. Do you not? I don't do them. Who does them? Uh, a king's counsel or a barrister. I can do them if I want, but mm. like I said, I'm so busy that I cannot be in a courtroom for a month or a two month trial. I have to be going in and out because I have to service other clients. So when I'm in London, I've got a case happening in the Old Bailey right now, I made a case. So I'll be there, I'll sit in there probably for a day. The next day I'll go to see a prisoner in Wormwood Scrubs or Wandsworth or Pentonville. So I have to I have to be out and about and seeing other clients. I can't uh, commit to a six week or an eight week trial in, in a row. So I won't be able to do anything else. How big is it for a lawyer when they've got mainstream media on the case? Does that improve? Obviously, social media now you can promote your own stuff, but if you're working in a big case and it's on the mainstream, like, does that help with clients? Of course, yeah, yeah. Because people see you dealing with big cases, and they automatically 
want to know what's happened on that case. And if you get a good result, you get more clients out of it, don't mm -hmm. you? In Scotland, there used to be trial by media. The media used to write shit first before they went to court. Yeah, so people that. know about it, but I think it's all changed now. Like if somebody was to print a story about you about a certain case, can they use that in court and say, look, that's they've already said this in the newspapers, they can go against them in the case? Yeah. See, jury members are told specifically by the judge to not read up about the case or if something does come up and you're browsing the internet to not take that uh, into context when making your decision, deliberating. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get scared doing it? No. No. Somebody else is life in your hands and you're get a, it's 50 50. Get a bit nervous, but then I think to myself, it's not me. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not put that person in that situation. He's done it to himself. Any funny moments? Uh, Have you ever seen anybody trying to run over the fucking. No. I've seen that on, on Fiddles in uh, America. <laughs> yeah, try to jump over. The, I've seen it in America, but they fuckers just shoot you. Yeah, they will shoot you there. Here, they won't probably shoot you. Mm -hmm. They'll probably just run after you. No, do you ever look at cases that's all over the news and want to work on it? Yeah, of course I do. Everyone wants to be in high profile cases as lawyers anyway. I do anyway. Mm -hmm. How many lawyers in England? I don't know, there's probably about a thousand firms. That just shows you how much fucking crime's going on in it. Black crime. What's the biggest rise in crime you've seen lately? Biggest rise? The encrochat cases. What's happening with all that? Because I know the thing in France, they're trying to throw it all out, but... It just puzzles me why people were so brazen why on those phones. I don't get that. We're so confident that nobody's watching. I say this about normal phones. Forget the end phone. Yeah. I say never send a text message or make a phone call and don't expect it not to be read by other people or your phone call heard by other people. I say that to everyone. I talk minimal on the phone. I won't send much messages. I'm very careful with my phone just because of my privacy. I'm not doing anything wrong. But if you start sending silly messages like that, you know, I'm sorry, but you deserve it to an extent. And the Encro phones, it was a server, wasn't it? So if you own the server, you've got access to everybody's Encro. So you can know what kind of dealings taking place, what, what that guy's doing, what that guy's doing. Yeah. So even that aspect of it is not safe, I would say. But what other argument in those cases was that it's live interception. Live interception is not allowed in UK. You can have recorded interception, but live interception, you can't listen to people's phone calls. You can't do intercept, interception of those phone calls. How could you prove that though? That's exactly what we were saying. So. If the coppers, because the surveillance, you know, that's all the technology nowadays. If they, the coppers know everything, in my own opinion, they know everything because they so know many, everything. So coppers many know the main drug dealers yeah. out the area, who the main they criminals, who's doing what, who's the done what. But how far can they go? Because can they bug your phone, your house, with a warrant? Yeah, of course. Or is that against the law? Some they have to get a warrant to um, go through certain things. I mean, they, I've seen houses get bugged without warrants. People have found illegal bugs. Yeah, I've had family members find them exactly. in the car and stuff. You have to go and some people, even it's a matter of national security, you have to go get permission. And then you can in certain cases, in certain cases, but these guys, some police officers and some police forces are using that to an advantage just to get intelligence of people or about people. I've had cases where um, we had prison cells bugged and once we approached and questioned and confronted the prosecutor about this in court, the prosecutor, this is a true case, it happened in Birmingham Crime Court, the prosecutor actually fell and fainted in court whilst giving evidence. That's how nervous it was. He was Sorry, not the prosecutor, the officer, the police officer in charge who ordered the book. They wasn't releasing the information, you see. In the end, the, the judge at court said, no, he stopped the case. It basically means the case cannot go any further because we were asking, we kept asking, we kept asking, we kept asking for that disclosure. In the end, they didn't give in. And all that, that happened at court and the judge had just had enough after three trials and he threw the case out. 
Mm -hmm. So, yeah. There's a lot of corruption within the courts as well. There's corruption everywhere in life. There's but... corruption everywhere. We're living in a world full of corruption. Mm -hmm. But I've not myself first hand come across anything, but I've heard stories, a lot of stories. I've heard a story of someone I know that they seen, they used to work for the prosecution and they seen the prosecutor in a case shred CCTV, which would have collaborated with a suspect's alibi witness. So he's saying he's somewhere else at the time of a murder. That CCTV was shredded. I don't know how accurate this is, but somebody told me this. And because of that, CCTV being shredded, that person is now doing life imprisonment because he couldn't prove that alibi witness. It's mad, isn't it? Mad. When you think like that, how could somebody go out of the way and try to convict people so badly? A lot of people, they say to me, why and how can you defend someone who is guilty? First of all, I don't know whether they're guilty or not guilty. The courts make that decision. The jury makes that decision. My job is to provide a service. But nobody has ever said to a prosecutor, how can you represent or try to convict <clears throat> or send someone to prison who may be innocent? Because there are innocent people who are in prison, isn't it? Oh, I haven't interviewed many. It's been over 20 years in exactly. prison. Exactly. I've seen some of your interviews. Yeah. So how, why doesn't a prosecutor get asked that question? Why or how do you feel in trying to send innocent men or innocent women to prison? They don't get asked that question, do they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mad because the people who've spent 20, 30 years in prison for crimes they haven't committed, listen, not everybody in prison is innocent. There's fucking over 90% are all guilty as sin. Everybody will scream they're innocent, this and that. We get it, but the majority of people, the, the system isn't that flawed where, but I do genuinely believe if they want to get you, they will get you, even if that's setting you up along the fucking way. So I've, I've seen people get set up mm -hmm. on a big scale, mm -hmm. big scale. So what would happen if you found surveillance that there shouldn't be surveillance of that case be throughout then yeah they should do yeah mm -hmm. they should do when can they use it if they've got a warrant and somebody's signed it off to say look you can surveillance them but yeah, you the, can't the home secretary uh, has to give the warrant but you can't listen to their calls no you, you they Black. can bug your phones as well yeah they bug them anyway but it's legally, against the law legally legally uh -huh. they can if it's a matter of national security they can or prevention of a serious crime for example, sexual offences, like sexual child offences, some cases mm -hmm. I've seen happen, and also um, terrorism cases that can book. Just quickly, I want to mention this as well. A lot of people get caught because what they're doing is they're in prison on remand and they're phoning people from the prison phone, the actual prison phone. That's fully recorded. Oh, <laughs> I've seen a I lot of people. Mistake, mate. <laughs> of, did, yeah, did, I was in a place <laughs> called Lefum Hall, which was in Berlin, but it was a cushier jail. It was like you had your own key and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was at the end of my sentence. And uh, because it wasn't a big crime, it was only fucking driving offences, car chases. And um, they put me at Lefum Hall. But I was trying to get gear through over the wall. <laughs> and I phoned up and I said, listen, cancel those football tickets thinking try to be cool and the fucking came sets to sell ripped it out and put his back in b-hole just for that phone call of saying yeah, cancel yeah. those a lot football of tickets mistakes i've, I've seen people think, what football tickets you're in the fucking jail you're daft I, but I, was just I, I was just thinking it's not that i'm not that high profile in there it'll go under the radar but they must listen to it they every phone call yeah in detail mm -hmm. i've seen people that haven't had much evidence against them mm -hmm. you know oh, and i've said to them listen you'll be okay at trial They've gone on the phone, started chatting. To I don't get that as fuck. Even chatting on yourself, because mm -hmm. there was a little guy with ginger hair in myself from Falkirk or Dundee was, and I used to always think he was a copper. It probably was. Yeah. Do you, probably was. So what, what do you think is the, the most, is, is mobile phones getting people easier convictions now? That, a mobile phone is a police force's best friend. Even if they don't find nothing and they get a mobile phone, they can get a conviction. For example, a drug supplying conviction. They can arrest you and charge you for, and convict you for being concerned in supplying class A drugs if they just find your phone. Nothing else, no drugs, no money, nothing. If there's evidence on the phone, getting done. A lot of people walk into conspiracies and it's all because of their phones. Phone calls, of course, everybody knows phone calls. They can do a pattern. If you phone me, 
Um, and I found somebody else who gets caught with some drugs. That's a conspiracy again. Phone calls and text messages and social media gets a lot of people into trouble too, because a lot of people like to flaunt their wealth online. Um, if you haven't got a proper job and you're driving a hundred grand car, of course, police are going to come and knock your door. So a lot of people being silly like that just to impress other people. It's fucking scary and it's, it's you've been school, watching 24-7 boy stuff if you're active and you've got social media you've got an iphone track every move it's just i don't i can't you understand could go onto the that. locations on your phone and it will tell you yeah. exactly where you've been mm -hmm. you could go on to uh i think is um google i've got a google account i think it's google maps where it shows places that have been like 10 years ago like since i've had the google maps so yeah. they know where you are. They know everything about you. You've been heavily watched. Just like the Big Brother has in England. They watch everything. What would you uh, give? What advice would you give to anybody that's in crime? Don't Get try, out of don't, it. Don't do it. Yeah, simple. Get out of it. Then you're out of business, bro. I'd rather get out of business. I've made a lot of money now. Uh, but I, I like to see people do good. I've got kids myself, and especially little kids. Mm -hmm. I would not encourage anybody to do the life of crime, man. It's bad. What's, what do people need to understand when you are, they're in a life of crime? They need to understand that the law will eventually catch up to them. Secondly, when you're in the life of crime, you automatically get used to spending a lot of money. So all that money that you're making, sooner or later, is going to run out. Try to do something legit. You'll make more money out of it. I see people, young kids, killing it these days. Crypto, stocks and shares, they're doing everything, selling courses. A lot of people are making a lot of money and they're not selling drugs and they're not living a life of crime. So there's other things that you can do to make money. Would you ever want your kids to be a lawyer? Yeah, I would, yeah. I would. I'd like to, that legacy to continue. At least one of them. One of my kids wants to be a boxer. One of them wants to be a politician in Pakistan. He's already living in Pakistan now. He's only 15. One of them wants to be a lawyer. The other one ain't made his mind up yet. So where do you go? I know you said you want to retire early, but what's the plans for the next 10 years? I'll be sitting on my yacht, relaxing somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> drinking champagne, talking on your encro. I'm just water. <laughs> I've been drinking water. Yeah, I'm the same, mate. I don't drink, man. Yeah. I don't Which, think you can drink and function properly, brother, and do things, I don't know. See, that's one thing I do like about the the Muslim beliefs is I don't drink, I don't eat bacon, don't smoke, don't drink. I was actually trying to do a fast, but only lasted three days. Three days? My friend that was there, Imran, like he, he lost so much weight, but yeah. just, he, was, he was in my head. And Me listen, too, I lost a lot of weight. It'll cleanse, it'll, back on it'll cleanse it. your soul. When it's, it's about, it's just so many things. I said, fuck it, I'll try three it. Three days is good though. I just struggled with it not eating during the day and uh, yeah. I just, I struggled. But it shows the discipline yeah. You have to be proper disciplined for that kind of stuff, man. It's yeah, he lost so much. I do the cold water with him. Yeah, and then... We do the cold water therapy, but he lost so much weight. Yeah, but he just looked fresher, he looked cleaner. You do, and then after... after, um, I lost a lot of weight as well, to be fair, in Ramadan, but you, I put it back on quite quickly. Mm -hmm. But it's good for you. Yeah, it's, it's a good fasting is good for you, man. So, would you like to finish up on anything, my brother? No, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for having me. Just before I go, I'd like to say... Everybody just work hard in what you're doing. Nothing comes easy. Nothing worth having will come easy in life. If people are talking about you, your job's done because people only talk about you if you're doing something right. The loudest boos are going to come from the people right at the back of the stadium. People at ringside will not be booing because they are busy enjoying themselves and having positivity around them. And just before I go, I'll say, remember, there's a defence for every offence. <laughs> what about your social media, isn't that, bro? Friend? Oh, yeah, social media. Get in contact. Uh, Ahmed, somebody that needs a good lawyer. Ahmed Yacoub on Instagram, on TikTok, even YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. I've started doing videos. It's been a couple of months now. I've basically started to go in detail, in depth, about the little reels and shorts I'm making so people get a bit more understanding. So add my YouTube channel is Ahmed Yacoub as well and plug them yeah definitely listen brother thank you thanks for coming on today i thank wish you nothing but the best for the future you, enjoy your life enjoy family life thank you man and i look forward to seeing your future plans where you take things definitely man god bless you brother thank you man.